that name this morning hallelujah we worship you father we glorify you we thank you oh hallelujah for the name of jesus you have given us that name to use hallelujah praise you father we glorify you thank you for jesus hallelujah thank you for jesus because he came hallelujah and he broke the power of the devil over us hallelujah we thank you father for the name of jesus praise you father hallelujah Yes, there is power in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for the name. Thank you for that name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Father, this morning. We submit to that name. We thank you, Father. We glorify your holy name, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. I love that. It says, there is power in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. That's so good. I love that part. This morning I was just singing uh, that uh, song that says, you know, uh, demons are helpless at the sound of that name. Amen. Amen. The name of Jesus is powerful. Hallelujah. Thank God for that name. And I was hearing something, and it says the name of Jesus, uh, the name, Jesus has gotten that name three ways. That the name of Jesus is, uh, was given to him by inheritance, and the name of Jesus was bet- bestowed upon him, and the name of Jesus, he got it by conquest, by triumphing over the, e- the evil power of, and principalities. Amen? So that name is a powerful name. Amen? Hallelujah. Thank God for the name of Jesus. Amen. We can use that name and break the power of the devil over us. The curse that the enemy has, you know, put on so many. We can use that name because it is ours. We can use it. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Well, good morning. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's good to see you all this morning. We look good in Christ than out of Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> We look good in Christ. So thank you for making time to come this morning uh, to be here. And those watching online, we appreciate you uh, joining us this morning. Amen. Well, this morning, I would like to encourage you in Isaiah uh, chapter 54, verse 17. Uh, From the New King James, it says, No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. Amen. And this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Amen. I like what the Good News translation says. It says, but no weapon will be able to hurt you. You will have an answer for all who accuse you. Amen. I will defend my servants and give them victory. The Lord has spoken. Amen. Amen. So no weapon formed against us shall prosper. The word prosper means succeed or turn out well. What the enemy has planned won't turn out well against us. Amen. 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 And it doesn't mean that the weapon won't be formed. It will be formed, but it just won't hurt you. Amen. Amen. And, and a weapon is anything, uh, is anything designed to inflict pain or harm to us. But thank God we have been redeemed from that. Amen. Amen. But the way for the weapon not to work against us is if we put up our, we put up our guards. We put our guards up. You know, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, it says that the devil throws flaming arrows at us from time to time. It doesn't matter who you are. He throws flaming arrows at us, fiery darts at us. But the way we can stop that is by putting up our shield of faith to prevent those fiery darts from hurting us. Amen. I like what a minister uh, put it. He said, as believers, we have to adopt the posture of a boxer, right? We have to adopt the posture of a boxer. You know, a boxer is always has his hands up uh, in front of his face so that the blow, you know, to protect his face. And he has his elbow tucked in uh, around his uh, waist to protect his body. And also, uh, and he has his head hunched down. To, to protect the blows, you know, from coming to him. So that's the posture we should adopt as believers. 
We can't let our guards down, right? We are open target for the enemy. We have to have our hands up to block anything the enemy brings, our, uh, brings to us, brings against us. Amen? So my, w- why is the boxer doing that? He's protecting himself. So as believers, we have to protect ourselves as well from the blows of the enemy. Amen? So my encouragement for us this morning, let us use our God-given, uh, our God-given tools so that the weapon formed against us will not prosper. You know, hold up our shield of faith high. Don't put it down. Hold it up high. Don't put your guard down. Amen? Because we have few victories in the past. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we have few victories and then we let our guard down. No, the devil is coming back. You know, like it says in uh, Matthew, that when Jesus was tempted, he says, you know, the devil departed just for a season. He's coming back. So don't let your guard down. Put it up so that when he comes, you are ready to fight. Amen? So take the posture of a boxer and don't be an open target for the enemy. And you'll see the victory. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Well, that's my nugget this morning. I was excited about it. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. God is faithful. God is faithful. In other words, he can be counted upon. Hallelujah. Why don't we just say to him how faithful he's been to us. Father, we are forever grateful for your faithfulness towards us. While we were yet sinners, you demonstrated your love towards us by sending your son who gave himself for us that we can gladly stand before you and call you Father. You have been faithful for the Lord to send us forth your word. God is life and health to all our flesh. You have been faithful to give us the name that's above all names, the name of Jesus, that we the righteous can run into it and we are safe and we are secure. We thank you for the Lord that you can trust in you because Lord, you are not a man that you should lie, but Lord, you watch over your word to perform it. And therefore this morning we are forever grateful, Father, as we stand to worship you this morning. Father, we say you are good and your mercies endure forever. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Say this with me. For you are good. And your mercies endure forever. God, you are good. And your mercies endure forever. In other words, God's mercy doesn't run out. It's unlimited. If you ever gone to a restaurant, a restaurant, and they tell you that uh, your drink is unlimited or your fries is unlimited. In other words, you can eat as much fries as you want, but they'll never run out of fries. Otherwise, they'll never tell you it is unlimited if they know they don't have enough supply. And so when God says he's unlimited, his mercies are new to you every day. There is no way over 7 billion people on the earth can outrun his mercy. And that's why you can always stand in the morning and gladly declare that, God, you are good and your mercy is endures forever. And because he's good, his goodness is running after you. Which means, are you attractive to the goodness of God? Because you don't want his goodness to pass you by because you're not attracting the goodness of God. Just like a magnet. You have to be one who attracts the goodness of God. Wherever you go, I attract healing wherever I go. I attract peace wherever I go. I walk in love and attract love. Why? Because God's goodness is running after me. That doesn't mean that you're not going to face challenges. But when challenges come, be bold. Begin to smile because you know who you are. Just because you face something does not mean that God's mind has been changed. He doesn't change his mind. Why? Because he has given his word and it is established and that settles it. Now you either believe what is established or you don't believe what is established. But I choose to believe what is established. Amen. And therefore I can gladly declare that God is my father. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Say this again with me. God, you're good. And your mercies endure forever. 
I'm forever grateful that you love me. You have flooded my heart with your love and I am lovable. I love everyone with your love because I am full of your love. Glory be to God. Do you believe that? Now turn to your neighbor. If you believe that the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart and you are full of the love of God, turn to your neighbor and tell them, I love you. And after telling them, I love you, tell them, because I love you, I want to treat you for lunch today. If you believe it, you sit down. If you don't believe it, you still stay standing. Those who believe can sit. Those who don't believe can remain standing. You know, that is what love does. Love gives. You know, the world always receives. But God always gives. And we are born of God, and therefore we have his nature. And the nature that we have is a nature of giving. And if you are a believer who is not used to that, you need to learn to begin to do that. You should have a nature of giving. And therefore, when you declare that the love of God has been shared abroad in my heart, and I'm full of love, and I love each and everyone who is around me, and whenever I see you, I have the nature of God, and that is the nature of giving. For God so loved that he gave. While I was yet sinner, he demonstrated his love by giving his son for us. Amen. And therefore, that should be our nature. Our nature is a nature of giving. Amen? Amen. So good to see each and every one of you here this morning. I'm glad to God that uh, you are well Amen. and you are sound. Amen? Amen? Now, don't be fooled by that. If I say you are well and sound, that don't be fooled that you know what? There is nothing that is coming against you. It just means that I'm secure in who I am. That's right. Amen. That's right. And so... Somebody could be going through something else and they are smiling because they know who they are. That's right. And so don't be fooled and look around and say, look at them the way they are smiling. It seems like nothing is happening. <laughs> no, lots of things are happening, but they choose not to focus on that. They choose to focus on who they are and what they have because that is what gives them the victory. Amen. Amen. You know, focusing on your problem doesn't give you the answer. That's right. That's right. So we have to learn to get our minds out of the problem. Amen. The more you look at the problem the more you begin to think like the problem and the more you begin to act like the problem and the more you begin to live the problem. Amen. But the moment you begin to look at the answer, you begin to think like the answer, you begin to act like the answer and you begin to receive the answer. Amen. And that is the mindset we need to have because we've been made conquerors through Christ. Hallelujah. And no, that was not just a one time. That's, right. That's an all the time. Hallelujah. That's your life. I am a victor. Amen. Amen. So good to see you this morning, and uh, those who are watching online, thank you so much for joining us and uh, being faithful with us, and I uh, thank God that uh, we are understanding why God brought us together. Amen. God brought us together because he's doing something in us, through us, and amongst us. Amen. And anytime you're not together, it means that God's work is being slowed down. Because God works effectively when the body is effective. Amen. And so I'm forever grateful that we are united in one, working together and doing things together. Amen. You know, I remember at my workplace, uh, there are times or there are days that things come up. Some people are not feeling well. Some people have other assignments and, and things going on. And as a result of that, it reduces the number of people who are available to work. And you know, that day we are not where we need to be. Because people are missing. And so that's the same thing in the body of Christ. When we stay committed, we are going to places. When we don't stay committed, we are not going to places. Amen. But I thank God that we are committed to the body whom God has placed us into. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad you're part of that? Yes. You turn to your neighbor and say, I'm glad you are committed. Say, <laughs> so because of your commitment... We are going somewhere. Where are we going? We are already in heaven. Remember I told you one time that, you know, if you wait to die to go to heaven, you'll be surprised. <laughs> because we have been given access to heaven. And right now you should be familiar with heaven that the time you die, you walk in there, you, you, you're familiar with it. 
But if you're waiting to die and then begin to go there and say, oh my goodness, what is that? <laughs> so where have you been? As believers, we should be familiar with what heaven looks like. And we get that through our manual. This is our manual. You go through this manual, it has every de- instructions to help you in everything you need to do. Amen. And so I'm forever grateful that we are committed to the body of Christ that we are part of. Amen. Amen. MFS was sharing this morning about uh, not putting God in a box. Because, you know, sometimes we have our own kind of mindset. And the kind of mindset we have is a mindset of this is how God is going to do this for me. And this is what I want God to do for me. Well, that is what you're expecting God to do for you. But how he's going to come through for you is in various ways. Amen. Amen. And so if you believe to trust God that I don't know how you're going to do it, but I know you're going to do it. Amen. And if you do so, it's going to be helpful to you. I remember when I was doing my final year at the, at the med center, uh, I did not have the fees for my final year. And therefore, they told me that since you don't have the fees, uh, you can take student loans. Well, within my heart, I did not sense that I need to get the student loan. Not that because I'm special. Now, just being led by the Spirit of God, I didn't think that that was something that I needed to do. And so I began to pray to God and say, God, what do I do about this? What do I do about this? So uh, I was sent to the financial office, and they gave me all these forms and said, if you fill that out, all of this, you will qualify for one of the financial, uh, whatever money they're going to give you, the loan. And so I took them with me, and I was praying to God and saying, God, I don't, in my heart, I don't understand that I need to take this. But I know you'll come out for me in one, in one way or another. So it took me a week. I never had anything. Never had anything, what to do, what not to do. So then I made up my mind. and said, okay, since I cannot hear anything, I'll just go to the financial office, give them this back, these forms, and say, you know what, I really don't think I need to fill out all this, these forms, <laughs> and then see what will take place from there. And so I did that. I took my forms, and I went to the financial aid. I said, you know what, I, I really don't feel like I want to fill these forms out. And so the lady grab the forms and say, uh, you know what, if I'm you, I will not pass this one. And I say, what is that? I say, that is free money. I say, how free is it if I have to sign it? He said, actually, it is money that has been given that if you sign for it, they'll pay for your fees. But then after you've graduated, you have to commit to work for five years. And when you commit to work for five years, then that uh, loan that you have will be lifted up. I say, let me sign that one. <laughs> And I signed it through. But what was happening is I was trusting God, and I did not know how God was going to come through. But you see, when you're trusting God, sometimes some things are not clear to you. But you just follow what you understand. And when you follow what you understand, you find out that actually God was leading you through that. And therefore, you have to get God out of a box. And if you want to get God out of a box, the bookstore right now is, on, is, is having a sale. And that sale, there is this book that was written by Dale. It let God out. You can only do what God can do. Uh, you can only do what we believe God can do. And then he said, let God out, introduces you to a, a God of abundance and presents strategies on how you can know this unlimited God and turn him loose into your own life. And therefore, you can let God out of the box you have had him in by believing his promises. Walk in faith, obey his every directive, and applying the practical and le- revelatory principles presented in this book. Praise God. So if you want to begin to think out of the box, there's a book here to help you out. Amen. It's, it's on sale. Uh, there's also another book here, Don't Be Stupid. <laughs> or if you know anybody who's stupid, just give them this book. You know, holidays are coming through. Just wrap it well. Don't give it to them like, just wrap it well. Say, I want to be a blessing to you. <laughs> when they open, they'll say, don't be stupid. Well, it is about life can be messy sometimes, all right? We all have done things that weren't, be, weren't best. We've all been in some not so good Piggy pen situations. But no matter how bad it gets, the good news is that we don't have to be stuck in our circumstances. God loves us. He is able and willing to pick us up and set us out on our feet again. Amen. Amen. If you've ever been in a situation that you never want to get back into again, don't be stupid. (laughs) So on sale, you can get it over there. Amen. Well, then someone also was inquiring if you have any CDs there. Yes, we do. Do you know that you have been gifted by God? Every one of us, not just the ministers, every one of us has been gifted. And therefore, you have been gifted, and your gift only works best through you. It doesn't work best through somebody else. In other words, I can't tell somebody to do what I've been gifted to do. 
Only I can do that. And therefore, if you don't discover your gift, because you have to discover it, because you realize the, born, mom, mom, the moment you're born again, you begin to understand who you really are. That simply means you're discovering who you are. And therefore, with the kingdom of God, you have to keep on discovering who you are. And therefore, you, are, you have a gift and you are a gift. And the moment you discover who you are and you discover the gift that you are, guess what? You become a blessing to many people. So there is this here, CD there, discovering your gift. You know what kind of gifts are there. And everyone is supposed to minister their gift to somebody else. It's also on sale. Then there's another CD here that is, it takes a village. Well, we were not designed to navigate life by ourselves. You know, we, we like to be independent, especially the nation of America has it said, I am an America and I can do everything by myself. And so you've got to design, yes, I am an American, yes, but I wasn't designed in life to live by myself. Amen. Depression goes up high because I'm by myself. But if you fellowship with one another, there is something that is happening. You know, science says that when you speak with one, somebody else, you're releasing some hormones that is making you feel good. It's better than eating chocolate. <laughs> Talking to somebody else. <laughs> so we were not designed to navigate life alone. There is no blessing in individual mentality. Even Jesus operated within a group. Find out where there is strength in numbers, why there is strength in numbers. And therefore, you understand why the animals walk together. The zebras, the, the hyenas, and the lions, even though the lion is a jungle, the king of the jungle, he doesn't walk by himself. They walk in numbers. Why? Because we were never meant to be by ourselves in life. We were meant to walk together because there is strength in numbers on sale there for you. Uh, there is here a CD for healing scriptures. If you don't know the healing scriptures or sometimes you feel tired, you don't want to read, just plug in the CD and begin to listen. And as you listen, these healing scriptures tell you that God's word is medicine for you. It enters into you and gives you life and gives you health to all your flesh. They are all on sale there that you can be able to have. And then, how many people would like to have money? Oh, yes. <laughs> Only a few. The rest, when we get, we'll share with you. <laughs> because we've been blessed to be a blessing. You know, if in the world, I'll keep it all, put it in a can... Put the lid on the can and sit on it. And then you come worship me for me just to give you a little bit. But in the kingdom of God, I want to make all that I can and then be a blessing to you. Amen. Why? Because you have to know that you have been blessed to be a blessing. Amen. And so if you want to learn something about finances, this one will tell you what kind of attitude God wants you to have towards money. Yeah. Because sometimes you have bad attitude towards money. But God has a way that he wants you to have or an attitude he wants you to have about money. And then what is your part in receiving all that God has provided? Because, you know, sometimes you are partial. I'll receive healing, but when it comes to money, don't give me anything. I didn't ask you to give me anything because I don't want that. The same grace that brought salvation is the same grace that brings gifts. I remember when God co uh, corrected me on that because uh, someone was trying to give me money. I said, I don't need it. Yet I was believing God for it. I was expecting God to, I was still in a box. God, you either have to put it in my pocket or you have to drop it right in front of my feet. If you don't do that, then it is not from you. And so therefore, God told me, I was blessing you through that individual, and you denied me to bless you. And therefore, I began to say, oh, I'm sorry. Next time someone comes, I'll receive it with both hands. Because I know God is working through you. Because finances come through money, uh, through people. Amen? Amen? God will never rain it from heaven. So what attitude does God want you to have about, uh, on money? What part... Are you playing in receiving all that God has provided? This one will also help you understand the tithing and how to be, uh, how can your blessings be multiplied? How about oaths and vows? Have you ever made vows about something and have you never committed to them? Has God ever made a vow and has God committed to them? You understand about that. And then avoiding traps of uh, wealth. I, I fell into a trap of wealth one time and I've never fallen into it again. So if you want to learn to how to avoid those traps, this, uh, this uh, USB flash will help you. Uh, if you want to know how to build wealth, a lot of people want to know how to build wealth. This one will help you. And prosperity in everything you do. If you want to, these materials are in the bookstore. They are on sale. You can have them. And then last week, if you did not receive the believer's authority or you went to the books and we ran out of it, it is there also on sale. You can have all those books there for you to be able to grow yourself and increase yourself. Amen? Amen. 
Someone can say, why do you want us to read? Well, the Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. So you decide how well you want to do by how good you want to read. Someone one time said, a leader always is a reader. If you want to lead in health, you want to lead in finances, you want to lead in joy, you want to lead in peace, you have to read. And if you read, you prosper. Because you know what? Ignorance is no defense to God. Amen? Amen. You can stand before God and say, I didn't know. My people perish for lack of knowledge. Because you did not know, you are destroyed. And God doesn't want you to destroy. Your pastor doesn't want you to destroy. And there are materials there for you. Amen? Amen? Well, praise the Lord. Ready to hear the word of God? Well, while you're getting ready to get into the Word of God, I'd like to encourage you, this coming Sunday we'll be having our guest. I invite your friends, invite your relatives, invite those who think they are your enemies. Because as a believer, we really don't have enemies. God takes care of whoever thinks they are our enemies. We love on every one of them. So invite them, let them come, and be uh, blessed by the ministry that will be coming to us this coming weekend. And uh, you'll be able to see what, can, what God can do through an individual. Uh, Pastor Party, when her husband died, she continued to stay with the vision that God had given to them, the husband and her. And uh, as a result of that, they have many schools under them in the Southern Pacific. They have many churches under them in the Southern Pacific. And they reach those people through a ship that they are able to travel through to be able to be a blessing to those people. And you'll just see her heart's desire to why it is important for you to stay committed and obedient to the vision that God has given to you. Paul himself testified of that, that King Agrippa, I choose to stay obedient to the vision of God. (coughs) And if God can do it to one individual, what about you? And therefore... I'd like to encourage you this coming Sunday, you don't want to miss both morning and evening so that you can be able to hear what God has prepared for us. Amen? Amen. Well, today, I'll begin to share with you on the authority that we do have as believers. We believers have authority, and the authority we have is for us to be able to triumph and live victoriously. And if we do not know how to operate in our authority, then we will not be as effective as we ought to be. Well, we understand that authority works effectively when we know our identity. Anybody who doesn't have an identity or does not understand their identity, the authority will never work well in their life. And therefore, a lack of identification causes confusion. It causes frustration and even causes abuse to be in place when authority comes into place. And therefore, once you understand your authority, then it is easier for the, uh, no, if you understand your identity, it is easier for your authority to be able to flow. And I just want to give you a few instances to help you understand why this is important. Have you ever been in a hotel? Someone comes and knocks your door. And you say, who's there? Do they ever tell you their name? No, they say their position. They say their position. They are identifying housekeeping which means that identity has got some authority towards you. But if you deny that identity, you're denying the authority. And therefore, you who is carrying that identity, if you do not understand your identity, you'll abuse that authority. Whenever a police officer comes, they don't tell you their name. They tell you police, Omaha police, or whatever it is, and then they'll say, I'm officer so-and-so. Why? They are telling you, they are identifying who they are because their identity has got power with it. And therefore, when you understand that identity, it is easier to flow with the power. If you go to a bank, you want to see someone, whom do you want to see? Well, someone will come to you and say, I'm the banker or I'm the manager of this bank. Why? Because I am identifying with who I am because I have authority in my identity. And therefore, once we understand our identity, then it is easier for us to be able to flow in authority. And if we don't, then authority is going to be abused. And that's why we've seen some people abuse authority. We've seen some police officers abuse authority, why they don't understand their identity. 
We have seen some spouses abuse one another. We have seen parents abuse children. We have seen teachers abuse children. Why? They don't understand what their identity is. If you understand what your identity is, then you will not abuse your authority. Because authority comes with identity. And the moment you understand your identity, then the authority flows well because I know who I am. And if you don't know who you are, then I'll abuse my authority. And I'll begin to control and manipulate people with that authority. Yet authority is never meant to hurt. Authority is meant to empower. And therefore, you are in power to empower somebody else. A parent is empowered to empower a child. Spouses are empowered to empower one another. Police officers are empowered to empower the citizens. And therefore, if you don't understand your identity, you'll abuse the power or you'll cause frustration and even confusion with that. And therefore, because of authority, I want us to really understand our identity. And now when we talk about the authority of the believer, I know uh, if you've read the believer's authority, I'm not going to start in Ephesians because I want to take you through a different journey before I come to Ephesians because I want you to understand how your identity flows with that power. And if you really don't understand your identity flowing with that power, you'll be believing for something that you never see and you'll be frustrated. Because what you are expecting is not what you are. Amen. And if you understand who you are and you understand who you are dealing with, then it is easier for you to be a recipient of that power. So turn with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Now sometimes we come in the middle, as believers you come in the middle and you hear someone talk about the authority they have as a believer. And then you grab that up and you begin to say and do whatever you heard someone else say. And then you realize, how come it did not work in for me? Well, you have to understand your identity. Once you understand your identity, that authority will work for you. If you don't understand your identity, you'll be trying. I, I can't go out on Ford Street and begin to lift up my hands to stop vehicles as a police officer. Just because I saw one do that. You know, that's how sometimes we do it as believers. I had her say that, so I'm just going to say that. Is she saying the right thing? Absolutely. Are you saying the right thing? Absolutely. But do you understand your identity? What authorizes you to do that? Because authority is effective on the power that is behind it. Yeah. And the power that is behind it is the identity in which you are in. If you understand the identity which you are in, then the power will flow for you. So in John chapter 1, verses 11 and verses 12, <coughs> <coughs> He is talking about Jesus. <clears throat> he came to his own, that's Jesus Christ came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Now the word there to receive means they did not want to identify with him. He came to his own and his own did not want to identify with him. His own did not want to uh, work together with him. And so what did he do? But as many as received him, which means there are those who chose to identify with him. There are those who wanted to be able to be associated with him because his own did not want to associate with him. His own did not want to identify with him. So, but as many as wanted to associate with him or wanted to uh, identify with him, to them, he gave them the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Now, the New King James Version says to them, he gave the right to become children of God. The word right there simply means power. If you read the King James Version, it says to them, he gave them the power to be called or to become children of God or become sons of God. Therefore, here you see the word power there simply means authority. In other words, you are given a right. You have a legal right to be a child of God. You have a legal right to be a son of God. Why? Because you have chosen to identify with him. You see, once you choose to identify with him, you choose to be able to, uh, to work with him and be with him, then he gives you a legal right to function with him. In other words, now he's delegating his authority to you. He's delegating the power to you. To delegate simply means to transfer power to another to carry out or transact business on your behalf. So in other words, the moment you accept him, the moment you receive him, in other words, you're saying, I choose to identify with him. And I choose to be able to work with him. Therefore, he says, now I'm transferring my authority, my power to you. I give you a legal right to transact business on my own. You are now my representative. Now, let me ask you a question. If you are a representative of me, let me say I pick Mary Alice and I say, I want you to go to master's school and talk with the 
uh, principal at master school and ask them, in what way can we be a blessing to them? Now, in what authority are you going? The authority of the pastor, because the pastor has sent you to go and transact business on his behalf. Now you are operating in my authority. And so when you go to the place, you're saying, I've come from Jubilee Church, and I've been sent by the pastor to come and check how we can be a blessing to you. Now she's transacting business on my behalf. Every decision she makes, every action she does, it is on my behalf. Why? Because she has chosen to identify with me. What if she says, what if she says well, I don't know if I can do that, Pastor. I don't know if I, I, I agree with you on that. You see, she's choosing not to receive what I have. She's choosing not to identify with me. And therefore, she can never flow in the authority that I have. And therefore, you've got to understand the moment you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, there is this delegation that has been made to you. You now have the right, a legal right, to transact business on his behalf. In other words, now what you say, what you do, is as good as he said and he did. Amen. Now we have to be careful because you have to do it in line in what you have received. You can never do it beyond what you have received. Now what did you receive? What did you receive? You received him. You do not just receive his word. When you receive him, you receive his word. When you receive him, you receive his power. When you receive him, you receive all that he has. So what does that mean? Means that because, because you accept him, because you choose to identify with him, you have received everything that he is. And if you've received everything that he is, then now you have everything that he has. Now, that should help you as a believer now to realize because if I'm going to flow in his power, I'm flowing because I am, a, I am identifying with him. Amen. So I'm not looking for power. I'm already powerful. Amen. That will begin to help us because sometimes we begin to look for power. I need the power to pray. I need the power to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. No. Did you receive the power to lay hands on the sick? Or did you receive him? If you've received him, you've received power to lay hands on the sick because once you have been delegated authority to, authority is released through words. And once you received him, what did he do? He gave you the right. In other words, he delegated to you and he says, you shall lay hands on the sick. In other words, because I've accepted you, I choose to identify with you. I will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. On whose authority? His authority, not my authority. But if I don't understand that, if I don't understand that, can you just put it back up again? If I don't understand that, then I'll be looking for some power somewhere. And you see, it is a disconnect. It's like me standing on the street and saying, police officer, and the vehicle comes running. I run out again, and I, and I run out again. Why? I'm trying to do what the police did, but I don't have the identification to do the authority that goes with that identity. And you see a police officer simply walks in really well that street and does this and you stop. If he does that, you just pull over. Yeah. Why? Because authority has been delegated to that officer. Now you've got to understand when we are talking about that, we're going to talk about this later on. The police officer doesn't have the strength ability to stop a vehicle. Right. He can't stop that vehicle. He doesn't have the strength power to push that vehicle back, and as you accelerate, you say, you're not going to pass because I am strong. I have the authority. No. He has been authorized, delegated authority, to stand and realize this. Authority is only as effective as the power that is behind it. Yeah. You know what is behind that police officer? If he's an Omaha police department, the whole city of Omaha is behind that police officer. Yeah. And so if you do anything against that police officer, you're doing it against the city of Omaha. And so if you have ever done something against a government employee, you usually receive a letter, you're being told, the city of versus, Amen. or the state of versus. In other words, it's not just you versus him. It is now the state that is coming after you, or it is now the city that is coming after you. Why? Because you are defying 
the authority that was, that was conferred or bestowed upon an individual. And that individual was not carrying out their own transaction. They were carrying out that transaction on behalf of. And therefore, when you mess up with that individual, you just messed up with the whole city. Amen. And therefore, you have to understand as a child of God, you hold a very important position in the kingdom of God and on earth. Amen. And therefore, your authority is not against your fellow human beings. That's right. That's right. Your authority has been given to you to be able to push back the forces of darkness Wicked spirits in heavenly places, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, rulers of darkness of this day and age that are trying to be able to stop the work of God from moving forth or the light of God to shine forth. We have been authorized to do so. So as many as have received him, how many? Many, which means God says, I open this, it's a buffet. As many as will receive me, that is Jesus, I will give them the right. I will bestow upon them. I will confer upon them the right to become my children or my sons. And now that you've received that, then now you need to understand then that now you have to relate with him. You have to identify with him. As long as you relate with him and identify with him, guess what? You will always get everything that he has. Do you know why some of our marriages today are having issues? Because some of us have refused to receive our spouses. In other words, we get married, but we choose not to relate with our spouses. We choose to relate with our parents and with our friends and with our siblings. And therefore, we have contentions because, but this is what my parents said. This is what my friends say. This is what my siblings say. But did you realize that the moment you get into God's covenant, he say you leave your mother and father and you cleave, you become one. And now when you become one, then now you choose to identify with your spouse and you leave alone your parents. Yep. Nothing against parents. <laughs> because parents were given them their time to do something, impart something upon you. Now when time has come, now you are going and you're not going to depart from what was given to you. And even though you will remember what your parents did, but now I am identifying with my spouse. You know, there are some people who will not identify with their spouse. They'll identify more with their siblings and friends more than their spouse, yep. causing issues in marriage. This is what my friend told me. But what are you and your spouse identifying with? Well, I don't agree with you because this is what my friend says. Well, do you understand the living and the cleaving? Joining together. As many as received him, he gave them the right. You see, you can never experience the right of marriage without receiving your spouse in that marriage. In other words, I renew my mind now with my spouse. What are we agreeing upon? What are we doing? Because the moment I begin to identify more with my parents and my siblings and my friends, then I'm not going to get the full benefit of this marriage. And therefore, as many as received him, he gave them the right. If you do not receive, you don't get the right because now you're not walking with him, you choose not to identify with him, you choose not to flow with him, and as a result of that, then the power is not walking, walking together with you. Now, receiving Jesus is one thing, but allowing him to work in your life is another thing. Because I can receive him as my savior, but I have to allow him to be Lord. There's a difference between him being Lord over your life He's many people's savior, but very few people, Lord. Amen. What does it mean? Because the Bible says, doesn't the Bible says in the book of Romans that those who shall call him Lord shall be saved, right? And therefore, you have to call him your Lord. What is a Lord? A Lord is a master, a ruler, one who has power and influence, one who has authority, and therefore, you have to submit to the Lord. When you submit to the Lord, then you're getting the benefits of the Lord. If you are ever renting a property, you have a land, landlord. Why is he called or why is he or she called a landlord? Because she's the master over that land that you're living in. Yeah. And so you have to go by the 
influence of what that Lord is telling you over their land. If they say in this land, no animals, then you have to submit to the Lord of that land. If the Lord of that land says, no more than three people in this property, you have to submit to the Lord of that land called landlord. If you don't submit to the Lord of that land, then there's a high possibility you'll no longer be enjoying <laughs> that land that the Lord has allowed you to be in. And therefore, when Jesus is your savior, he has to be your Lord. And if he's your Lord, he has to be your master. In other words, you have to obey and allow him to do what he says he is. And if you don't, there's a high possibility you'll not experience what your Lord has prepared for you. So the authority is there, but are we willing to make him Lord of our lives? If you don't make him Lord over your life, then it simply means you'll not enjoy the benefits that are there. How do you make him Lord over your life? That's where mind renewal comes into place. Mind renewal now is like, you know what? Yes, I am thinking this way, but I have to go that way. Because that is what he is telling me. Because your Lord has got the best intentions for you. Your Lord has got the best plan for you. And therefore, leave alone your little plan that you think is great and get onto the plan that is greater than your great one. And once you do that, power begins to flow. Power begins to flow. But if you don't do that, then you are trying to ask for power that you already have that is yours, but you're not willing to identify with that power. So when we begin to talk about the authority of the believer, you'll understand that the authority will begin to flow really well when Jesus is Lord. But when he's only a savior, authority doesn't really flow well. Because yes, can I share a secret with you? When, Jesus is, when you only see Jesus as your savior, you only see him up to the cross. You only see him up to the cross. But you know what? The cross is a place of defeat. You have to move on to resurrection. Because resurrection is a place of victory. And so if he's only a savior, I'm only, sto I'm only stopping at a place of defeat. Why? He defeated the devil. Amen. But then he raised up from the dead as a place of victory. And therefore, if Jesus is my savior, praise the Lord for the cross... Because he was crucified on that cross. But wait, wait a minute. He wasn't left on the cross. Amen. Why? Because now he was triumphant over it. And it means if I identify with him and he's my Lord, then I'm also raised up together with him. Which means I have to do things the way he tells me to do. And if I don't, then I will not be able to experience what he has prepared for me. And therefore... Authority, when it is delegated, it will flow effectively to the degree you're willing to submit to it. If you're not willing to submit to that authority, there is a high possibility that authority will not work. Let's take, for example, again, a police officer who does not really believe in everything he's supposed to do as a police officer. Do you think that they'll function fully as a police officer? No. No. To the greater degree you submit to that authority, it is to the degree by which you will function. And therefore, our submission to him as Lord actually allows the power of God to flow through us. So to the degree you submit to him as Lord is the degree by which you will all be able to operate in the power. Yet the power is there. And therefore, you have to be willing to submit to that authority. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26. Now we have been given the right to be the children of God. In other words, we now need to continue to identify with him. We need to continue to associate with him as his children and begin to obey and flow with him. Why? Because there is something that needs to work in us and through us as his children. Why? Because that authority has given us something that we never had before. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26. Galatians 3.26 explains to us we as the sons of God what we need to do. And now he says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. 
In other words, if you have received him, he says as many as received him, he gave them the right. He gave them the power. He gave them the authority. Now, when are you sons of God? When are you sons of God? The moment you received him, because as many as received him, he gave them the right. So the moment you receive him, you became a son. You became a child. You're now empowered. You have a legal right. Now you're being told for now, because of that, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. In other words, you have the right to transact business on his behalf. So if that is so, then we need to begin to renew our minds and begin to look at things. If they're not in order that they're supposed to be, we are supposed to put them in order as he did. The Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing Good and healing all those who are oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. If God was with him, God is with you. Because you've received him. And if you've received him, then now you have the right, the legal right, to transact business just like he does. And I am a son now, not tomorrow. But to the degree of me operating as a son is actually dependent on my willingness to submit to that sonship. If I'm not willing to submit to that, I will not flow in that. We see this even today. If you have children and your children are obedient and submissive to you as parents, what happens? Everything is open. But what if they begin to say, I don't do this and I don't do that, and they begin to do like, okay, you know what? You are still a child, but we're limiting you on some things. You can't have that, and you can't have that, and you can't have that. Why? Because you're not willing to submit to this authority, then you cannot experience the power of this authority. Amen. So to the degree you're willing to submit is the degree by which you'll experience the authority that has been put over there. Now, I'm telling you this because if you will begin to understand what authority we have as believers and what authority we need to function in as believers, it will be easy for us to flow in it if we understand we have to be in authority or under authority in order for us to flow in authority. You can never flow successfully in authority unless you are under authority. That's why Jesus himself said, I only do what I see my father do, and I only say what I see my father say, which means I am yielding and submitting myself to his authority. And as long as I submit and yield myself to his authority, him and I are one. I am in you, and you are in me. We are one. And because we are one, when I begin to walk and speak, I'm transacting business on your behalf, just as if it is you, Father. So when someone comes and says, if you are willing, heal me. He did not say, okay, let me check with my father and see what he wants. No, we are one. And I know how my father operates and says, yes, I will be healed. Why? He knows how to release the power. Why? Because before the dynamic power or miraculous power flows through you, you must understand what the delegated authority is. Because delegated authority will allow you to operate in dynamic power. And because we do not understand the delegation of authority, we want to work in dynamic power. We want to see people healed. We want to see people uh, being set free from oppression and bondages, but we're not willing to submit to God. And so people will simply say, oh, I'm just going to pray this and do that, and I'm believing God, his word is going to take place, yes. But then how how come it's not working? To the degree you submit, to the degree you yield, to the degree you're willing. Not my will, but your will be done. I really don't like that right now, but you know what? I have to submit. If I want the power to flow, if I want the, the, the authority to flow, then I have to submit to the authority. What does the authority say? Play, pray for those who persecute you. I don't like, the, I don't like being persecuted. <laughs> I don't like being persecuted. And you're being told, no, you may be persecuted, but you're going to be crushed. Amen. So just submit to me. And when you're submitting to me, I'll bring you through this. If we learn those secrets, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we will see the power of God flow like never before. They were willing to go to the fire, yet God says, if you believe in me, you'll never be scorched even though you go through the fire. Because who created the fire? Me. Now, man cannot use what I've created to hurt you if you submit to God. Because God says, I'll simply take the sting out of it. And when I take the sting out of it, you'll go through it like nothing is there. So when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they went in there, the sting of the fire was taken out. 
And so even though the flame is there, <laughs> but there is no sting of it. But you have to submit to God. Same thing happened to Daniel, who created the lions. God did, but Daniel submitted. They all said, we are not going to defile ourselves with what the king wants us to defile ourselves with. And we are not willing to bow down to any other God than our God. And man takes advantage of God's creation because they do not understand their identity. They overuse their authority or they abuse their authority and say, because you are not listening to me, I'm going to punish you. Well, authority is only supposed to correct those people who are doing wrong, not punish those who don't agree with them. Amen. See, if you don't understand that, you don't agree with me, I'll punish you. But that's not what authority is for. Authority is to empower. So if someone is not doing something right, then authority needs to step in and correct that. But if you don't agree with the authority, the authority is not supposed to punish you. And so they decided to punish Daniel by throwing him into the den of lions. God says they can do that, but I'll take away the sting from the lions. And I've seen some people who, some artists who've drawn a picture of someone they call Daniel laying his head on a lion. But I know he was in that den. The lion looked at him and said, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> say nothing much. Say, good. I'm just taking my siesta. They say, oh, good. Me too. I'll take one over here. And the same king comes up and realizes, you know what? Are you still there, Daniel? Say, oh, yes, I'm still here. Takes him out, throws those other people in, and guess what? The sting is put back in. Because God knows whoever submits to him is operating in his authority, and there's no way you're going to crush God. Amen. So I may go through the fire, but I won't be scorched. But you have to understand that. You have to know that I have to submit. If I don't submit, I won't see that. And therefore, we are now sons of God through faith, which means it is by faith that we accept over him, and it is through faith that now we have to live. In other words, how I feel, what I go through, does not dictate who I am. I have to stay who I am in him. Amen. Because in him I live, in him I move, and in him I have my being. Amen. And as long as I submit to that, but what if they do this and they say this? Don't pay attention to what they do and what they say. Pay attention to who you are in him and who he is to you. Amen. Change your mindset, because if you don't change your mindset... You will be like John and James. Let us call fire from heaven like Elijah did. And Jesus said, you don't know what kind of spirit you're after. Because if that is the reason why I came, this place should be gone just like that. Amen. <laughs> so we have to change because we don't understand what all that is about. Now, the very same faith we had to receive him, it is the very same faith we must have to live in him. And in 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, I'm just setting some groundwork over here. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and verses 2. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and verses 2. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. To bestow simply means to confer or to appoint. So the Father has love and he is love. And because of his love, he has appointed unto us or he has given unto us because of love, not because of what you did. Because if you don't understand this again, you'll think, now nah, I'm a child of God because I prayed. I'm a child of God because I shared the word of God. I'm a child of God because I meditated on the word of God. No. God loved you even before you first loved him. And because of his love, he has conferred or bestowed on us who has received his, child, uh, uh, has received his son that we should be called the children of God. Now, who is supposed to call you a child of God? So he has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. In other words, someone should look at you and call you children of God. Amen. You should be called a children of God. Now the issue is if we don't understand our identity, I want you to call me a lawyer, call me doctor, or call me... Kenyan, or call me Ethiopian, or call me, in other words, now I'm identifying with something else 
because I'm not identifying with who I am. Yeah. See, a lack of understanding who you are will make you identify with something else. But if you identify with him, then I am a child of God. Yes, I may be practicing as a doctor, or I may be practicing as a lawyer, or I may be working as a nurse, but I am a child of God. I don't identify as a nurse. Yes, I work as a nurse. I don't, if I don't identify as a doctor. I work as a doctor, but I am a child of God. Amen. And God has said he has bestowed, he has given this to you. He has conferred it on you that you should be called a child of God. And if that is true, then this is the mindset we need to have. I don't get upset if someone doesn't call you with what you do for a life, for a living. Amen. How come you did not address me, doctor? Are you a believer? You're supposed to be called a child of God. People will get upset. Believers, I'm talking about believers. We're not talking about non-believers over here because <laughs> First John was written to believers. And I actually says, we are and we should be called the children of God. But you know what? So we as believers should be calling one another as children of God. We should be seeing one another as children of God. Never, ever, ever see your fellow believer as a different nationality, as a different race, or as a different gender. Never ever see your fellow believer as that. Because you know what? The world does not know us. We have to introduce ourselves to the world. Look at the next one. Therefore, the world does not know us. Why? Because it did not know him. We are the ones who know him because as many as received him, we chose to identify with him. We chose to be able to work with him. So he gave us the right. So we who have received him have been given the legal right. And therefore we know one another as the children of God and the world doesn't. Why? Because they did not receive him or they have not received him yet. Now we call one another children of God, which means the world is going to learn unity from us. But if we begin to carry out the world business in the church, then guess what? The world will not know any difference who is a child of God. Yeah. And you can bear me witness, you've had some of your co-workers or neighbors who says, you know what, so-and-so calls themselves a Christian, and I question that. Okay, you question their Christianity and you're not one which means you know something better than them, or you're expecting something different from them since you're not one of them. Yeah. And so we are supposed to be known as the children of God, and therefore we're told, beloved, now we are the children of God. When? Now. Not when we die and go to heaven. Not when we pray for the sick and they are healed. Not when we receive our financial breakthrough. Now we are a child of God. Say, I am a child of God now. I am a child of God now. When are you? Now, now, if you are a child of God now, you have received a legal right to be a child of God, which means now you transact business as if you're transacting it out for God. When? Now. If we understand that, then now I begin to think like he thinks. How will you want this business to be carried out? See, get God out, get God out of a box. Because this is how I think you're going to do it. He said, no, 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 no. I has not seen nor ear heard nor entered the heart of man the thing that God has prepared for those that love him. You love him? Yeah. Yes, you've not seen it yet. So he's going to do what? He's going to help you see it. And therefore, if that is the truth, then we have to introduce ourselves to the world. The best compliment the people of the world can give you, you are a true child of God. If they don't call you that, you have some work to do. Let me prove this real quick to you. John chapter 4. You remember Jesus at the well, with a woman at the well? So when he went to the, the well, John chapter 4, Verse 7, he says, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. So who's speaking? Jesus. Jesus is a son of God. Jesus came to teach us how a son relates to a father on earth. He came to show us how a son relates to a father on earth. So here Jesus is speaking a son who is under submission of the father. And he's saying, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Verses 9, then the woman of Samaria said to him, 
How is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have got no dealings with Samaritans. Right away, this woman doesn't know who he is. She is identifying him with the race. See, the world will identify you with the race. You have an accent. Where is it from? That's what the world will identify you with. What nation are you from? What do you do for a living? That's what the world is interested in. So the woman says, I am a Samaritan, you are a Jew. But you don't know who is speaking to you. Now it is his opportunity to let her know who he really is. And so we're going to see how this transacted through. And so she says, how is it you being a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a, a Jew has no dealings with a Samaritan. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you'll have, him, you'll have asked him, and he will have given you living water. Now see how Jesus shifted that. If you knew the gift of God, you not say, hey, lady, let me tell you, do you know who's standing right before you? <laughs> he knew that he submitted to the authority of God. And therefore now he's transacting business for God. And then he tells her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you. In other words, I'm not here under my own authority. I'm, I'm here under the authority of my father. You will ask me and I will give you living water. Well, in the next verse, the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you, give, where, where, where then do you get the living water? She is still stuck in the natural in the race. You are a Jew. You want water. You have no bucket. How are you going to get living water? At least I have a bucket and I have a well. And I can dig it because Jacob is the one who drilled this well for us. But you are a Jew. How can you get that? In verses 12, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as the sons and his livestock? She doesn't know that she's speaking to one whom all these people yielded to. Verses 13, Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, which means the one that you're showing me, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Verses 15, something must have happened through that conversation. Verses 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water. Wait a minute, I thought you say, where are you going to get this water? You are a Jew. And I'm a Samaritan. I have a bucket, you have no bucket. Now the woman is saying, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. In other words, you have something I don't have. And I need what you do have. Why? Because when you speak, there is something, that you, when you, there is something about your words that when you speak those words, they make me change how I think. Because Jesus said, I only say what I hear my father say. So when he's transacting business, he's transacting based on the father, not based on him. And so the more he speaks to her, the more she begins to get something. And Jesus said to her in verse 16, go call your husband to come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have said well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one whom you now have is not your husband in whom you spoke truly. Verses 19, this Makes a whole difference now. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. I saw you as a Jew, but now I perceive you are a prophet. What has changed? How you conduct yourself. Which means the moment you understand the identity you have, there is a way you conduct yourself that sends information to people. The way you speak and the way you carry out yourself. Someone looks at you and say, I perceive there is something special about you. Before I saw a Jew, and this Jew who came to me had no bucket and was talk talking to me about living water. Does he think he's greater than Jacob who dug this well? Whom do you think you are? You see, this is not three days later. This is a matter of a few minutes later. I perceive you are a prophet. Now you are called 
sons of God. What have you learned? Now you are sons of God. And you should be called sons of God. In other words, Jesus wasn't there to be given glory. Jesus was there to let the woman know you can also be a child of God. Because the world have not received the gift of God. And if you knew the gift of God, you will be asking for it. But because you don't know the gift of God, you will never go for it. But I'm here to introduce you so that you can be part of this gift. And therefore, we as the children of God, we are operating under the authority of God. And our job is to allow the world to see the gift of God so that they can also become a gift of God. But before you see that, authority will never flow because you'll see somebody out there who is doing something and saying, in the name of Jesus, I take authority. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, what's wrong with these people? And they look at you and say, what's wrong with you? You are a believer, I don't want to identify with you. And yet you can be able to conduct yourself really well and say, you know what? I've never seen that that way. I want that. I remember there is this uh, resident at work that I was training and uh, he didn't believe in God. And I knew that straight away then when I began to work with him. And um, he was speaking some languages that I would not like to say or repeat over here. But I knew that what he says has got no authority or power over me. Amen. Because it is what I think or speak, that's what God will do. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I think or speak according to the power that is at work in me. Amen. And so I said, God, how do I minister to this individual? So then I began to share with the individual. And then after sharing with him a little bit out of work, like, yeah, we are doing work stuff. He said, like, you're you are explaining this really well. I said, well, thank you. And then I began, he began to ask me about life. And I began to share my life in a different way, in a language that he understands. And then he asked me, let me ask you a question. You know, when you talk to me, and the more I hear you, there's something special about you. I'm like, now he's getting something. But you see, that's not what I'm going to say. Uh-huh, you better look at me now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I'm, con I'm cutting out a transaction. There's a business being taken care of right now. Yeah. And so the business is, yes, something is special about me because of what I believe. So what do you believe? I knew very well he's not going to believe in God. So I'm not going to say I believe in God. I say I believe in a supreme being. And when I say I believe in a supreme being, he was, oh, I believe in a supreme being too. I said, great. And I said, it's my supreme being that helps me be who I am. That's what makes me special. And so he said, okay, what does your supreme being do? I said, my supreme being empowers me. Oh, really? He said, yeah, how does he do that? When I begin to think of the things he has done, it just empowers me. Say, so we do the same thing, but it is different. <laughs> so say, how often have we been doing this? I do it all the time. Even now, I can just do it, and it empowers me. And that's why I'm full of joy, because my supreme being empowers me. Then he says, do you mind if I ask you, who is your supreme being? <laughs> say, my supreme being is God. Say, oh, okay, tell me more about God. See, the approach by which I used has allowed him to be able to receive this. And you know what? He began to go to church. He said, I want, I want to find that God. Because he was not in a position for me to lead him, but he, at least a seed has been planted for him to find that God. He came and told me, I've gone to church. Amen. And, you know, and so he began to go through different churches. But you brought him from a place of having no regard to God, now beginning to look for God. Amen. But what is it? You need to be called a child of God. You need to be called a child of God, the way you conduct yourself, the way you carry out your transactions. So this woman here said, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped, now she changes the language again, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that you, Jerusalem is the place where you ought to worship. Again, referring again back now to the race. I perceive you are a prophet, but you are a Jewish prophet. No, I'm not a Jewish prophet. <laughs> then Jesus said to her, woman, believe me that the hour is coming when you will neither... On this mountain, not in Jerusalem, worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we, uh, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Verses 25, the woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. 
When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So she's looking forward for Christ to come someday. But you're right here speaking with him. As a child of God, you're introducing people to Christ. I know God can do this, but do you know I am an ambassador for Christ? God can do for you what you're expecting. It is right here. Transacting his business for him. Yeah. Amen. I'll let, a little bit later on, I'll, I'll share to you how the body is important. But verses 27, he says this. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he, he talked with a woman. Yet no one says, what do you seek? Or why are you eat talking with her? The disciples had been with her for a long time. But when they saw him talking to her, they got upset. Why? They got into the flesh. They're identifying him. You are a male and she is a female. You are a Jew. She is a Samaritan. What are you doing? In other words, you also don't know who he is. No wonder he was asking them, whom do men say I am? And whom do you say that I am? Which means you also don't understand who I am. Because if you understand who I am, you'll understand the relationship that I have with the Father. And they never, never asked him who he was or whoever he was. Verses 28, the woman left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? It changed from a Jew to, you, uh, to a prophet, to a prophet of the Jew, to now this is Christ. Amen. How long did this take? It might have been maybe an hour, or less than an hour, or more than an hour. I don't know, but it did not take days. Amen. So when the Bible says... God has bestowed upon us to be called the sons of God, then people should be knowing you as a child of God. And people should be actually following you as a child of God. They should know if there is anything about God, I, need to, I, I know whom to go to. There's an individual whom I know that told me that they believe in all gods and they believe in all nature. <laughs> okay. But... The way I conducted myself, the individual is in a place of pressure. The individual was able to reach out to me and say, do you think there is hope? <laughs> well, I thought you believe in all gods and you believe in all nature. What do they see? They see something in you as a child of God because now you are a child of God. You are con conducting business for God. Power is going to flow through you as a result of your submission to God. It is not about me. It is about him because the moment I received him, I submitted myself to his authority. It is no longer my words. It is no longer my actions, but it is his words that are helping me act the way I'm acting. Now, when I understand that, then now his miraculous power are about to begin to flow. Why? Because I am submissive to his authority. And once I'm submissive to his authority, guess what? His authority will be seen and people will be able to call upon the name of Jesus. They don't call on the name of Jesus because I fasted and prayed, because I submitted. There are people who've submitted themselves to God and people have never known, and wherever they go, people are able to tell immediately this must be a child of God. Because there's now a nature in you and a character in you that makes a whole difference. So here, this lady went to the city and told the people, this must be the Christ. Verses 39, he says, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they hired him to stay with them and said there are two more days. And the more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we now know that this is indeed Christ, the Savior of the world. The time you spend with the people in the world, the more they ought to be convinced that you're a child of God. Amen. Within two days, the whole city was convinced this indeed is Christ, the son of the living God. And now they can begin to see miracles, signs, and wonders because now they are choosing to identify with him. Now they're choosing to work with him. Do you know why he did not do many things in his own town? Mark 6. He says, there he could do no mighty works. Why? Because of the unbelief. We choose not to identify with you. We want the power, but we don't want to identify with you. If you want to flow in the power, you have to identify with him. And therefore, we have to understand that now the moment 
We accept him. Now the question is, how do you identify? How do you identify? With the spirit or with the flesh? How do you identify? Do you put his image first or do you put your career first? I am Dr. So-and-so. I am nurse so-and-so. I am pilot so-and-so. I am pastor so-and-so. The question is, if you put the pastor before you, the question is, if you're no longer pastor, how will you identify yourself? There's nothing wrong with being Pastor Anthony, but if you're no longer a pastor, will you still go with Pastor Anthony? No, I'm a child of God. Amen. Pastor is just an office that I've stepped into, and I'm functioning in that office. But a time will come where I will not be in this office. Yeah. Somebody else will be in that office, and I'll still be a child of God. Amen. So why don't we stay with being a child of God? Amen. Now, let me help you also. There's nothing wrong with addressing the office, because at first, when I started being a pastor, I, I was uncomfortable people calling me Pastor Anthony. I just, they just called me Anthony. And then God corrected me and told me, you are denying them of their right. I said, I'm not denying them of their right. I said, the moment they address you as Pastor Anthony, they are addressing the office. And I want to flow through that office. And when you tell them, don't address me as pastor, you're telling, I don't want you to contact this office. So from that day on, I said, okay, it's okay if you call me Pastor Anthony, because I know the burden is not on me, the burden is on him. So that's why sometimes we say, Pastor, I don't know what to do. I don't know either. But I'm listening. He says, tell him this. And I say that. Why? Because you are putting a demand in the office, and I listen to him. What do you want? I don't know. If they ask me, it's not within my power, my ability. But he says, because they've asked the office, he is going to fulfill it. Amen. And therefore, once we have accepted him, now we need to imitate him. MFA taught us last week, imitate, be imitators of God as his dear children. In other words, begin to be a copycat of him. Why? I have his nature, and I have his character. His nature and his character now teaches you to behave in a specific way. <clears throat> now, my behavior and my actions or words are as a result of my nature, which means the way I conduct myself and the way I speak is as a result of my identification with him. I identify with him. I don't think that, okay, now I'm about to go to the grocery store, I better begin to profess the word of God because now I have to go there. Then after the grocery store, oh my goodness, I'm back now. Praise the Lord. No, no, no. This is now your nature, your ongoing nature. Now you are a chance of God. When? Now. Which means every day, all the time, you are a child of God. Amen. Now you imitate him everywhere you go in everything that you do. Question, how do you identify? As a spirit or as the flesh? And the moment you identify with that, you've got to understand that now this nature gives you the opportunity. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone be in Christ, he is a new, which means you have a new nature with a new character. And if you are a new creature, what has happened? All things have passed away, which means the old nature with the old character have passed away. Everything has become brand new. And since everything has become brand new, all things are of God. And because all things are of God, then now because of his nature in you, you are now a partaker of his divine nature. To partake means one who is in union with. I now partake of his nature. I now partake of his, of, of his character because I'm one with him. I'm not trying to be him because I'll never be him. But because of my union and identification, now I am a partaker of his divine nature. Don't you know that the Bible says in, I think it's 2 Corinthians 6, 14, that you are one with him in spirit if you've received him. If we are now one with him, then now I can begin to flow with him and begin to act with him and be just like him. Amen? Amen. Now turn with me to 1 Corinthians, no, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Glory be to God. Amen. That is a good groundwork Amen. to help you understand how power now begins to flow. Therefore, verses 15, Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So Paul is saying this to the church at Ephesus. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. 
the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him up from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but in the world that is also to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. <coughs> when we read these verses over here, most of the time we think of how God raised him up and God sat him in the heavenly places, far above every principalities and every powers. God raised him up, that is true. But did you ever realize that when God raised him up, in verses 23, it says, and, uh, verses 22, and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. So we always look at him that he was raised up and things were put under his feet, right? So we see Jesus' feet, right? But what did he say at the end of that verse? Put under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things. To who? To the church. Which is his? Body. So if he's the head of the church, the church is his what? The church is his body. And where are the feet located? In the body. The feet are not located in the head. So since the feet are not located in the head, the feet are located in the body. So when the head was raised up, it means the body was also raised up. When the head was seated in the heavenly places, it means the body is also seated in the heavenly places. Amen. You have to get this, because if you don't get this, then I'll be thinking, oh, it is him who has the authority. It is him who has the power, because he is the head, and all things were put under his feet. That is true, things were put under his feet. Now, let's take your head and join it together with your feet and leave your body alone and see how authoritative you're going to be. <laughs> And therefore, you've got to understand, Paul wants us to understand something. When he says, I pray to God to give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him that the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened so that you may know what is the help of his calling. In other words, he called you for something. What did he call you? As many as received him, he gave them the right, the authority to be called the sons of God so that you can transact business for him. That's why there's an exceeding greatness of his power towards you. Who believe? You are believing. You who? You who? The body of Christ. You are believing there is a power that is flowing towards you who believe in him, who received him. Amen. Once you've received him, then now you are a member of the body, and now there's an exceeding greatness of his power towards the body that believe, and now you carry out business on his behalf because the head and the body are one. Amen. The head and the body are not two things. Amen. They are one. And therefore you need to begin to understand what authority do I have now and what authority do I walk in unless my eyes are open to see and to know, I will never be able to partake of that. Just like the woman in John chapter 4, she says, I perceive you are a prophet. The church has to perceive and realize I am the body of Christ. Amen. Which means the church is called Christ. Amen. You can read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And you'll see that the church is called the Christ. And you are a member of the body. Amen. Which means power is flowing through each and every single one of us. And whenever we come into unity and we begin to walk in one, guess what? The power of God is amplified through the body that believes. Because there's, a, there's an exceeding greatness of his power towards us. Us who? Us who believe. Believe in what? Believe in him whom we've received. And if we believe in him whom we've received, as he is, so are we here on this earth. Not in our own authority. Guess what? Because my identification comes from receiving him. Now, as long as I identify with him and I believe him, then guess what? What is in him is in me. What is flowing through him is flowing through me. Why? Because I submit and identify with him. And as long as I submit and identify with him, what he is, I am. What is flowing through him is flowing through me. Why? Because the head and the body are one. When he's raised up, the head and the body are raised up. When the head is seated, the body is seated. When the head is triumphant, the body is triumphant. Amen. You cannot have a sick body and a healed head. 
We have to be one. And therefore, as members of the body of Christ, it is time for us to begin to look at this and begin to be positioned in the body of Christ and begin to function in our identity so that the body, the power of God can begin to flow through us. We are not victims of one another. We are victors together. We were never brought into the body to fight against one another. We were told to fight the good fight of faith as the body of Christ under the authority. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. We were never given authority to fight one another and see how strong you are. No. Our strength is not against humanity. Our strength is against principalities and powers. That is what our strength is for. And therefore, when principalities and powers are trying to put things out of order, the church rises up and says, in the name of Jesus, you have to submit, you have to bow. Why? Because the head and the body are one. That is what the head is saying. The head is saying the church has to reveal to the principalities and powers what the authority is all about. And the, and the church stands together and saying, no way, no way, no way will this ever happen. Amen. Which means now the church begins to change his way of thinking and his way of speaking because I have his nature and his character in me. His divine power is inside of me. If that is so, then you'll find out that the church has not been as effective as it ought to be in its community. Because we do not understand the authority that we do have, and as a result of not understanding the authority that we do have, guess what? We sit and talk like the world. Where is our community going to? What's wrong with our leaders? Who is identifying with him? When are you a son of God? (laughs) Sons of God should reign with him in life. Did Jesus stop reigning when he was raised from the dead? No. He delegated it over to you. And I'll be able to get into that and show you more. Why did he delegate it to you? He said in Matthew chapter 28, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, which means there is no authority on earth or authority in heaven that he doesn't have. Amen. Which means you and I are going to face authority on earth that we have authority over as a church. But we must be under submission to his authority because he has it and he's delegating it over to you. And therefore you must submit to him and say there is no powers on earth that will able to hinder his power to be in operation. Amen. If you don't understand that, we'll sit down and say, well, we don't understand what's happening in our world now and it's Jesus come back. Jesus say, I'm not coming back unless I find faith on earth for people who are going to stand in my name. Amen. I didn't give you my name to fold your hands and just say, look how pretty I am. It is to transact business. It's not for you to carry out your own things. Remember, the power will be in full effect according to the willingness of your submission to its power. If the church is willing to submit to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of God will be flowing. But if you're not willing to submit, guess what? We'll be like the world. But guess what? The creation is yearning to see the sons of God. When are you going to be called the sons of God? When are we ever going to rise up as children of God and begin to be called children of God? When are we going to stand and begin to declare and say enough is enough? No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Enough is enough. Any weapon formed against us shall not prosper. When are we ever going to stand up and say any tongue that rises against us in judgment will not prevail? As children of God, we say no more in Jesus' name. When are we ever going to do that? We are going to do that the moment we choose to submit totally to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ as one. We begin to walk as one body because the head and the body are one. And we begin to declare and decree. And the moment we declare and decree, people will say, those are the sons of God. Which means it starts with our own personal decision. I choose to be a child of God. I choose to see you as a child of God. And I choose to call you child of God. And once I begin to do that, guess what? We are now choosing to identify with him. And once we choose to identify with him, guess what? The head and the body have been aligned. And everything is under our feet. We triumph over them. So when he was saying, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, go ye into all the world and make disciples, means I have authorized you now in my name. So we'll be able to look at some things. What authority do you have in his name? You have authority in his word. You have authority in the blood. You have authority as a child. Authority has been given to you to transact business. Not for you to use it as a rabbit's foot. (laughs) You don't submit to his authority. Oh, Jesus, help me right now. Well, how have you been living? Is he Lord over your life or is he just a savior? Which means you've been hanging on the cross, yet he has already been raised. He was raised from the cross a long time ago. 
and is triumphant. Didn't he say he showed, he, he defeated all principalities and powers and made a show of them triumphantly? Yes. And if he did, that is what you're supposed to be doing. You make a show of them openly. No demonic spirits are going to mess up my family. No way, no how. Amen. Me, a child of God, as I submit to him, Amen. only if I choose not to submit, then you're going to destroy my family. If that is not true, then what we read in these scriptures are all false. And he said, my words will never pass away. Amen. And you're born of his word. Amen. And he says, whoever is born of me, over. You see, if you don't have power, you can't overcome. I can't say I'm going to overcome Travis if I know very well I'm not strong, stronger than Travis. <laughs> I'll be running away from him because I can't overcome you. Because I know the moment he just does this, I'm down. But the Bible says, whoever is born of God does what? And who is born of God? And you are a child of? Now. When? Now. Hallelujah. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, not next year, not when you die, now. Amen. So now you understand even the least person in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. We have authority. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we honor you this morning. We are forever grateful for your love that you have demonstrated towards us through your son. And Father Lord, I thank you for sending forth your word this morning to us. And Lord, it has ministered to us. And Father Lord, we receive your word with meekness so that we may be able to save our souls. Lord, we thank you that the entrance of your word enlightens the eyes of our understanding. Lord, we can see what you see. We can hear what you say. And Lord, we can receive what you have given to us. And as your children, I declare, Father Lord, we understand that we are identifying one with Christ. Being one with Christ makes us one with him. And therefore, being in union with Christ, we triumph together with him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I declare each and every one of us is walking in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. For the Lord, as we choose to position ourselves in you, we choose to realign our thoughts with you. Lord, we are able to transact business together with you. And Lord, we shall see eyes being opened. We shall see ears being opened. Lord, we shall see the dead being raised. We shall see communities walking in the fear of the living God. We shall see families being united together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we shall see our educational system, Lord, being transformed because of the presence of your power and authority in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I declare that we are the sons of God. We will live as the children of God. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I, am grateful I am grateful that you see me as your son. I see me the way you see me. You have given me your image. It is your image that you see. You've given me your voice. It is your voice that you hear. I will decree your word. I will speak your word, I will meditate your word, and I will stand on your word, and I'll see the completion of your word. Now, I'm a son of God. Now, I walk in your authority. Now, I walk in love. In Jesus' name. Any weapon formed against me shall not prosper. Any tongue risen against me in judgment I condemn it right now in Jesus' name. This is my heritage as a child of God, as a son of God. I walk free from fear because God has not given me the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. It is because of the blood we can be confident of whose we are and who you are. I thank you for the Lord for cleansing our conscience from every dead works as we serve you as our living Father. And Lord, I thank you through the blood Jesus obtained eternal redemption for us once and for all. And now we are eternally redeemed and we belong to you. And now, Father Lord, we will walk in the light that you have given to us. And Lord, as long as we walk in this light, Darkness will never overpower us. We thank you and we honor you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Well, praise the name of Jesus, you children of God, sons of God. Continue to live so triumphantly in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful rest of your week and looking forward to seeing you next week while we have our new guest or our guest coming in next Sunday.
Then after that, I'll pick up again from Ephesians chapter 1 and run with it. Stay blessed and have a wonderful time.